Let's go straight to Donald Trump. Uh, as the final result in the New Hampshire primary was closer than some expected. Oh, it's supposed in to be like a 20 point blowout, according to tracking polls. Well, and that's yeah. why I think Trump was mad. But then yeah. Nikki Haley came out pretty early in the night and said that she was marching on with her campaign. And Trump delivered a venomous victory speech after learning that Haley planned to stay in the race despite her loss to Trump. His wild appearance coming amid another day of angry binge posts on social media. It's not well. Who the hell was the imposter that went up on the stage before and, like, claimed a victory? She did very poorly, actually. You know, we won New Hampshire. Three times now, three, three. We win it every time. We win the primary, we win the generals. This is not your typical victory speech, but let's not have somebody take a victory when she had a very bad night. I find in life, you can't let people get away with bull****, okay? You can't. You just can't do that. And when I watched her in the fancy dress that probably wasn't so fancy, come up. I said, what's she doing? We won. Did you ever think that she actually appointed you, Tim? And think of it, appointed, and you're the senator of his state, and she endorsed me. You must really hate her. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's a shame. It's a shame. Uh-oh. I just love you. No, that's <laughs> That's why he's a great politician. You have the very, the now very unpopular governor of this state. This guy, he's got to be on something. I've never seen anybody with energy. He's like a uh, hopscotch. We have beaten Biden. You could almost say, who can't? Who the hell can't? The man can't put two sentences together. And just a little note to Nikki. She's not going to win. She's not going to win. But if she did, she would be under investigation by those people in 15 minutes. And I could tell you five reasons why already. Not big reasons. A little stuff that she doesn't want to talk about. I don't get too angry. I get even. Oh, that was kind of a little threat right there. Yeah, and I, that's going to be the choice for Nikki Haley. That's a threat. I just, just, uh, just, here we have Donald Trump mocking Chris Anunu, who made it clear yesterday uh, and has made it clear throughout this campaign, he is not a man to be mocked. He was on Fox News yesterday oh. saying that Donald Trump had gotten too old, that he was almost 80, and the Fox News host chimed in. He's 77. Yeah, said he's 77, to which <laughs> Chris Nunu said, yeah, hmm. almost 80. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll go over math later. <laughs> and then talked about all of his senior moments. And by the way, they were shouting geriatric from the crowd yesterday at Nikki Haley's event. This is what's freaking Donald Trump out. He's being exposed. But just for the record here, I'm reading from The Hill. Um, despite what Trump claimed uh, that, 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 that Sununu is very unpopular, he has a 63% approval rating compared to Donald Trump's 42% approval rating in New Hampshire. And as Cruz Sununu said, I've never lost an election. You have. And you think, Mika, and I agree, she should take Chris Sununu to South Carolina. Everywhere she goes. Everywhere she goes. I think, you know, I think for everybody has a different... Um, kind of a point where they feel that they're pushing things too far. I think that Nikki Haley is, you know, a, a very strong Southern woman. And, yeah. you know, at the same time, there might be some, some, you know, breaks in her brain where she thinks, oh, I can't go that far. Chris Sununu is showing her, yes, you can. When you're, when you're speaking the truth about someone who had sex with a porn star and then took the money for his campaign, let's start right there. Someone who defamed and raped a woman, let's start right there. Someone who stole documents and admits to it and says they're his, let's start right there. You know foreign policy. Go in there. Go after him. And let's talk about the threat that he poses to our democracy. I think that he can show her that it's actually easy when once you push through that. But Republicans have kind of like these breaks they put on in their brain where they're too afraid to go too close to Donald Trump. At this point, if she wants this campaign to continue, I don't think she has any other well, choice yeah, but to go in 100 percent after him. There's one way. There's one way out. And, and that is by winning. That is by going after Donald Trump. 
and just telling the truth. And as Mika said, it's it's the truth to say a judge in New York, after a jury said she was she she uh, Donald Trump was liable. Instead of saying I'm not uh, following for, that for for, for sexually yeah, sexually abusing her, the judge said what he did was rape. Let's call rape rape. And and then yeah, he, he funneled money to pay off a porn star a couple of weeks before his election. And my God, if a congressman or a senator or a governor or anybody had done that without reporting that, they would they would be in jail. I know. I knew members of Congress that got put in jail for going golfing in Ireland and coming back and reading a speech on the floor. So please, the double standards are really, really crazy. But John Heilman, um, <clears throat> I, you know, this idea that this election's over, Nikki Haley, I, I know that's what the Biden campaign wants because they desperately want to match up with Donald Trump. I know mm, that's what I Donald would be Trump's. be careful what you wish for. That, that, that's what Donald Trump wants. Um, the, the, the fact is, let's compare what people were saying about Nikki Haley at the beginning of the week and what they were saying about Nikki Haley at the end of the week. I mean, there was a lot of uh, growth just in those three or four days. She, she ended strong. Now she has a month to do that, to go around South Carolina, where she was governor for six years, to go to all the people she knows there. And again, she's got a month, a month. While Trump is going crazy, she can work the ground. And by the way, Meek and I met her when she was a state legislator mm -hmm. running for governor. Nobody, I mean, nobody thought she was going to win. Mm -hmm. Nobody. And when Meek and I left that first debate that we moderated, we said Nikki Haley's going to win. And she did. She beat a lot of big, powerful men uh, that were supposed to humiliate her. And anything's possible. She's got a month. Let's go to NBC News national political correspondent Steve Kornacki at the big board. Uh, Steve, uh, how did Donald Trump do it? And where are some of the areas that he ought to be concerned with moving forward? I mean, he did it by winning Republican voters. That's, that's the short answer. He won Republican voters by 50, five zero points over Nikki Haley. Um, what went wrong for Haley in terms of not getting this within single digits or really getting in position to have a shot to win is two things. First of all, in the population centers of the state, we saw this in Iowa. That's where the voters that she tends to appeal to are disproportionately voters with higher incomes, places with higher concentrations of college degrees, more moderate voters, that sort of thing. Yeah, Nashua, New Hampshire, the second largest city in the state, right across the uh, Massachusetts border is a perfect example. This was supposed to be in Haley's world. This was supposed to be Haley country, has exactly the kind of voters I'm talking about, and yet she didn't even win Nashua. This is a place she needed to win by about 10 points. And the other problem that Nikki Haley had is, and we saw this in Iowa, when you get away from population centers and you get to areas that are small individually but big collectively and that really are becoming the backbone of the Republican Party, especially since Donald Trump came on the scene nearly a decade ago now, we're talking about small towns, we're talking about rural areas, we're talking about places with lower median incomes, places with lower college attainment. Nikki Haley did absolutely nothing in Iowa with places like that. There were a quarter of the counties in the state where she got single digits, and that trend absolutely continued in New Hampshire and showed no signs of changing. A good example, again, we'll go to the Massachusetts border, but a little town, New Ipswich here, you know, Fitchburg, Mass, for point of reference, a little bit south of here. Look at this, 51-point win for uh, Trump over Haley here. Again, this is like an Iowa-like uh, uh, performance for her in a county that is similar to what she struggled struggled in in Iowa. So it, it all adds up to Trump winning this thing by double digits. And I think if we just go to the exit poll here, I think it really puts it in stark relief. Again, this was an electorate. You are not going to find another state like this. District of Columbia is the only thing I can even think of where the electorate is going to resemble something like this. 50-50, essentially, Republican and non-Republican. And look at among Republicans, 25 percent for Nikki Haley. You're not winning primaries if you're getting 25% of the Republican vote. You're not going to come close to the Republican nomination if you're getting 25% of the Republican vote. Where Haley was able to do better and keep this thing you know, to the low uh, double digits, independent voters made up more than 40% of the electorate. She did win them by 22 points. That's a big margin. That's a good margin for her. But put this in some context. 
That is not that is not by far the best margin we've seen among independents in the New Hampshire Republican uh, uh, primary. The biggest margin was 42 points. This is 22. The biggest margin was 42. That was John McCain in 2000. And John McCain then went to South Carolina, as this race will now go to South Carolina. And in South Carolina, George W. Bush was able to say, hey, John McCain is winning this thing or is competitive on the backs of non-Republicans. And he was able to turn that Republican electorate in South Carolina heavily toward him, toward Bush. Uh, I, Trump certainly saw him last night. Among all of the things he said, he seemed to be setting up a very similar dynamic. And he's got a stronger argument to the core Republican base than Bush or really any other Republican I think of had. Because this is a 73 point swing. This is more than a 70 point swing from Trump winning by 49 among Republicans to Nikki Haley winning by 22 among independents. That's a 71 point swing. That is by far the biggest swing between winners of those two groups that we've ever seen in a New Hampshire uh, Republican primary. And so simply, if you just look ahead at what's coming on this calendar, I can pull it up on the screen right here. Uh, you know, you have Nevada. The rules are you know, Haley's in a primary with no delegates. Trump's in the caucus that has the delegates. So Trump's going to get all those delegates out of uh, out of uh, Nevada. There are four in the Virgin Islands. It's a wild card. There's a possibility Haley could do well there. It's four delegates. You go to South Carolina, just mentioned all the issues. It's her home state. But the issues based on those demographics that Haley's going to have in South Carolina are profound. And the key here is once we're out of this, uh, uh, these initial states, the rules change. And in many of these states, the rules have been changed at the behest of the Trump campaign, which has a strong influence over the state Republican parties. They've not been changed in South Carolina. They've always been this way. You win a congressional district by a single vote, you get every single delegate in the district. You win the statewide vote by one point, you win the entire state's delegation, a uh, uh, delegate uh, pool. So Trump got about a third of the vote in South Carolina in 2016, he swept all 50 delegates. He absolutely could do the same uh, based on what we're seeing right now. You go to Michigan, it's split into two parts right here. You notice there's two different days. There's 16 delegates, there's 39 delegates. These are going to be given out proportionally. So Haley could get a chunk of these 16, but these 39 could, they're essentially winner take all because if there's two person race right now, and in most of these states that are going to vote Super Tuesday, the rule is basically if you get 50% plus one, you get all the congressional district delegates. If you get 50% plus one, you get all the statewide delegates. And in a two person race, hmm. it just means win. You know, it, it, Trump's getting 51 and Haley's getting 49. He will take all in a district or he will take all uh, it, it statewide. And you just look, you know, Michigan, you go down to, to, to a March 5th. It's a 50 percent rule in Alabama, in Arkansas, California statewide, 50 percent plus one yeah. closed primary. You, you win. Trump's at 66 percent in the latest poll in California. You get all 169 there. You know, now North Carolina is proportional. She could have Haley could have an opportunity there. Texas, 50 percent. You win the district, all the votes, 50 percent. You win the statewide, all the votes. This is, you know, Haley could do well in Vermont, I could see. But this is just a recipe looming on the 5th of March for what the Republican process is designed to do to get a nominee early. Yeah. Wow. All Thanks. right, Steve Kornacki. Thank you so much, Steve. Wow. Greatly appreciate it. It, it is. Uh, what I a will, night. I will just say again, what a night. I will just say again, it's very early. <laughs> so uh, we have uh, the next real contest that matters a month from now. And Willie, that's in South Carolina. I just I just want to say that, that you know, Steve showed us in two charts the, the, the problem facing the Republican Party. They elect a guy that gets 75% of the votes in the Republican Party uh, and loses and only gets about 35% of independent votes. So as Steve said, you, you can't win a Republican primary if your opponent's getting 75%. The other side of that is you can't win in a general election if you can't get 40 percent of independent voters. And we're seeing that in places like Pennsylvania, where Donald Trump's getting smoked and is going to lose. So this has been we've talked about this since 2016. It's still another conundrum. Also, you again, I can't say this enough. Donald Trump's getting about 50 percent of the vote in Iowa. He's getting about 50 percent of the vote in New Hampshire. He's running as, an, as, as basically a glorified incumbent. Has everything on his side. Everything on his side. 
This guy should be getting 80%, 90% of vote. If anybody, if anybody thinks that Barack Obama, if Barack Obama were running as a Democrat this year, if he could run again as a Democrat this year, those numbers would be asking, is he going to get 92% or 98% of the vote? Donald Trump is so weak and enfeebled as a politician compared to Barack Obama. And the fact that a glorified incumbent is only getting 54% of the vote and everybody's freaking out and calling him like a kingmaker is laughable. This guy, Willie, this guy has so many problems going into the general election. He is so weak, even in his own party, one out of four the voters in some states, uh, two, I mean, one out of three voters in other states are saying they'll never vote for him. That <laughs> is a weak, weak, enfeebled general election candidate. And yet we heard again last night the head of the RNC saying it's clear that people want Donald Trump. We need to unite around him. You had two more Republican senators, including John Cornyn of Texas, come out after the results last night and say it's clear the people have spoken. We've got a rally behind Donald Trump. You had all those men on the stage behind Donald Trump last night again. <laughs> And we should say the American people have not spoken. The people of Iowa, 56,000 or so of them, 160,000 last night in New Hampshire, just over 200,000 Republicans have spoken, as you say, just clearing Donald Trump 50 percent in both places. So just what we saw with Donald Trump last night melting down, even in victory and and that scene with Tim Scott. And Trump saying, oh, you must really hate her. She appointed you. You're from her state. Right. You must really hate her. I mean, humiliating Tim Scott uh, publicly. Uh, what, what was your take on that? Well, I say two things about this show. The first on Joe Biden, you know, I, I had, had lunch the other day with, uh, with a very uh, a significant Democratic uh, friend of the president's, friend of President Biden, and someone who's a big uh, donor and bundler uh, in, in Biden's world, who said that you know he had had a, a, a discussion with Biden toward the end of last year, in which he sort of said, you know, there is a different Joe Biden when it comes to being on the campaign trail. There is a Joe Biden, not to criticize. He wasn't. He, this person was not criticizing Biden as performance as president. But he was saying that kind of eye of the tiger. He needed to. He needed to basically come into the new year. Uh, at battle stations. He needed to really be on. And and this person said to me, he said, you know, look at Biden so far this year. Look at every time he's been done anything on camera in public in the course of January, uh, especially things that have been campaign related. He said there is a marked change in, in, in how much uh, sharper and how much more focused uh, and how much more fired up Joe Biden is. So that that's something worth noting. This has been a uh, after the first of the year, We've gotten a little bit of a, of a new, we've got campaign Joe out there. When it comes to Trump and Tim Scott, I just got to say, you know, it, 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 it feels like it, it should be an object lesson to any Republican. There's all these Republicans, and we saw them up here all weekend. J.D. Vance and Elise Stefanik and all these people who, who think they're going to be or trying to, to get on Trump's ticket. They all want to be Trump's running mate. Well, we've seen this in a million aspects of Trump's life, political life, the, the, the kind of supplicants, those who bow down and scrape before Donald Trump. And the Tim Scott thing that you saw, that to me was the most shocking thing, that he was obsessed with Nikki Haley in his victory speech, ungracious, unhinged. That some, in some weird way didn't surprise me. But that moment when he turned to Tim Scott and sort of basically looked at a guy who had kind of uh, prostrate, prostrated himself in front of Trump. He had abandoned Nikki Haley, a, a guy, a woman who had kind of made his political career possible, turns around and endorses Trump, is standing up there on the night that Trump is against Nikki Haley, and he all he wants to do is just, you know, quietly, uh, it's enough. His presence on that stage is enough. And instead, Trump turns and just humiliates him and makes him feel so obviously uncomfortable. To me, it's just an object lesson for every Republican. This is what you're going to get if you make a personal sacrifice or a political sacrifice for Donald Trump. He will, at some point, turn around and say, thank you very much, and now let me make a fool of you. Let me put you in a position where you are humiliated on national television. I, I don't think it's, 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 uh, it's restricted to Tim Scott. We've seen it over and over again, and we're going to see it. Uh, into the future, every Republican just take note. This is what you get for for being uh, nice to Donald Trump, being loyal to Donald Trump, sacrificing for Donald Trump.
That was a deeply, deeply pathetic moment, and as he had to sit there and smile through that and quickly scramble to think of something. No, I just love you. I don't hate her. Just it's going to be ten months of this, so get ready. Uh, and and Claire and Mike, I want you to look at Donald Trump here. This was a victory speech, okay? Just just take a look at this, and the guy melts down. Watch. Who the hell was the imposter? that went up on the stage before and, like, claimed a victory. She did very poorly, actually. You know, we won New Hampshire three times now, three. three. We win it every time. We win the primary, we win the generals. This is not your typical victory speech, but let's not have somebody take a victory when she had a very bad night. I find in life you can't let people get away with bull****, okay? You can't. You just can't do that. And when I watched her in the fancy dress that probably wasn't so fancy come up, I said, what's she doing? We won. Did you ever think that she actually appointed you, Tim? And think of it, appointed, and you're the senator of his state, and she endorsed me. You must really hate her. No, it's, uh, it's a shame. It's a shame. Uh-oh. I just love you. No, that's that's why he's a great politician. You have the very, the now very unpopular governor of this state. This guy, he's got to be on something. I've never seen anybody with energy. He's like uh, hopscotch. We have beaten Biden. You could almost say, who can't? Who the hell can't? The man can't put two sentences together. And just a little note to Nikki. She's not going to win. She's not gonna but if she did, she would be under investigation by those people in 15 minutes. And I could tell you five reasons why already. Not big reasons. A little stuff that she doesn't want to talk about. I don't get too angry. I get even. Here he goes. I mean, really? it's really. I mean, so, so here, really, you, he's going to threaten her, huh? You talk about confession and projection. Okay. By the way. Who can't beat Joe Biden? I'll tell you who can't beat Joe Biden. Donald Trump. Who didn't win New Hampshire twice, as Willie brought up last hour, when he claimed to win New Hampshire twice? Donald Trump. Joe Biden smoked him in New Hampshire. Uh, it, and uh, Claire, he does everything from uh, making fun of Nikki Haley's dress because he says it's probably not that fancy to, to talking about... Nikki Haley, there's stuff she doesn't want to talk about. Here's a guy who got caught illegally giving payoff money to a porn star. Here's a guy that a judge in New York said raped E. Jean Carroll. Here's a guy already found guilty of fraud. Here's a guy who's under who, who, who's been arrested for stealing nuclear secrets, who's been arrested for stealing secrets on our, 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 our war plans against Iran. I could go on and on, but I don't have time to list the 91 counts. Here's a guy, again, utterly shameless and utterly doomed to lose again in the fall. But the Republicans, the Republicans can't help themselves, can they? No, they can't. And, you know, I, I, I just think we have to keep reminding everyone, this guy's not well. Um, and, and what's up with the orange face? You know, I mean, has anybody, has anybody checked to see if, is he applying this cheap bronzer to his face in clumps at various times of the day and night? And does he not realize it makes him look like he's really unwell? He's a different shade every day. He's confused. He's angry. Um, it is, and by the way, cracks in the armor appeared last night. You know, according to Donald Trump, he's the incumbent. Right? He won four years ago. If you're the incumbent and you can't manage more than 50% of the vote in your own party, you are one weak sister. And it is not good for him that he did as poorly as he did, that polls were wrong. They said he was going to win by 20 or 30. He won by just over 10. Um, and frankly, there hasn't been a great enthusiasm. There haven't been a good turnout in either Iowa or New Hampshire. So I, I think, um, and Biden got a lot of data last night for those Republicans that will never vote for Trump, those independents who don't want Trump, 
And that's the key to the kingdom in this election, finding those moderate Republicans and independent voters. We're going to solidify the base. I'm confident of that. So um, a bad night for Donald Trump, really bad night. Speaking of the kingdom, your pin has not gone unnoticed. Uh, we also yeah. talk about that in just a moment. We'll, we'll give you time to gloat about the Chiefs okay. in just a minute. Uh, Mike, you and I were up there for a couple days in New Hampshire. Donald Trump wins last night by 11 points. Some of those tracking polls had it bigger than that. I don't, uh, the, those 20-point margins felt big. 11 is still a double-digit win. But if you look ahead to a general election, if he makes it that far, he just, in New Hampshire, couldn't win an independent voter. I mean, he won. He got a hold on the Republicans who actually went out and voted in New Hampshire. That was very clear. And by the way, 80 some percent of them who came out, the Republicans who voted for Trump said Joe Biden didn't win the election. So that message has gotten through and taken hold. It's completely flipped, though, with people who voted for Nikki Haley. Eighty five percent say, yeah, of course, Joe Biden won the election. So it's an independent problem among many for Donald Trump. You know, there's quite a lot, I think, in the two clips that we showed, the first clip of Chris Sununu. Uh, talking about the campaign and the election that was held yesterday in New Hampshire. And the second clip, obviously, of the former guy, Trump, on the stage uh, in a victory speech. Uh, and what I think is there is just what you alluded to. The, the target is independent voters. And Chris Sununu, God bless him, he's a star. He is now a star. And Nikki Haley's campaign... Toward the end of the campaign, she was very effective, very efficient, because of Chris Sununu, I think, in large part. And maybe if Chris had attached himself to her earlier in the campaign, or she had spent more time in New Hampshire, she may not have won New Hampshire, but I think she could have come in, into single digits rather than a double-digit loss. That's one thing. The other thing, the Trump appearance. Angry, self-absorbed, mean-spirited, that is not an attractive package for independent voters in this country, never mind just New Hampshire, voters in this country. You, you don't want to waste your vote for president of the United States on someone with that form of personality, that form of appearance. You don't want to live with that. And I think the longer it goes on, the longer Nikki Haley stays in the race, the longer she'll provoke more personal attacks like that. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work well for any Republican. It doesn't work well, certainly for the country. But I'll tell you who it does work well for, the Democrats and Joe Biden. Yeah, she's got another month. If she does, in fact, stay in, and she says she will another month from today <clears throat> until South Carolina. So buckle up. Let's go back up to Manchester, New Hampshire, where we find former MSNBC host, Chris Matthews. Chris, great to see you again today. Uh, what are your impressions this morning after Donald Trump's 11-point win last night? Well, my impression was really, when I watched it last night, of Donald Trump. I mean, he was, he was blown, up, blown, blown apart because here is uh, Nikki Haley, a relative newcomer to politics compared to Bill Clinton and people like that, pulling a Bill Clinton number. Back in 1992, Bill Clinton lost the New Hampshire primary by eight points to Paul Sagas. But at 10 o'clock that night, he went out way before the nightly news, the late news, and he declared himself the winner. You made me the comeback kid. This is exactly what Nikki Haley did last night. She came on when the polls were still very close, the results coming in very close, and she said, I won, basically. And that is exactly what is driving Donald Trump crazy. He put a lot of effort into this state. He held a lot of rallies all around the state, very carefully segmenting different parts of the state. He got a lot of poor people, a lot of people hard up, really, coming out for him in the Republican Party. And yet here she is coming out like a butterfly. You know, she was a caterpillar for a while there. And then she's a butterfly right in his face saying, basically, I won. And I'm going to be in your face now for months. And that is a statement he did not want to hear. He thought he could put her away. And he didn't mm -hmm. do it last night. She's going to be around for weeks. She's going to get a lot of media attention because, as you've all been saying this morning, she's a lot better now than she was a few weeks ago. She is now yes. the star or close to the star I thought I saw coming here when I came up here to cover this thing. I thought she'd get more closer to him, to, 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 to his weakness. And she's getting there with this age thing. And so's Chris Anunu. They were hitting him and hitting mm -hmm. him and hitting him. And he makes more and more mistakes, confusing her with Pelosi. Give me a break. That was a long period of time he was saying things like, she was the one that didn't take my 10,000 troops. What are you talking about? 
So I think he, right. she's going to go out just like E. Jean Carroll. She's out there. And other and the other people, the other witnesses. What, what do you think Mark Meadows is going to be like in the hearing in the, in the J J January 6th hearing? Come on. He's facing a lot of bad news and a lot of people who are out to get him with the truth. And it's not going to be pretty for him. And he saw it last night. She's out there like a butterfly. I thought I stomped her when she was a, a, a caterpillar. Well, she's not. She's a butterfly now. Let's bring in U.S. Special Correspondent for BBC News, Caddy Kay, the president of the National Action Network and host of MSNBC's Politics Nation, Reverend Al Sharpton, and opinion editor at The Washington Post, Alexi McCammon, Jonathan Lemire, back with us as well. So, Rev, I'll start with you here. Uh, what did you see last night in New Hampshire? What does it tell you about this race, but also looking ahead to the general election? What should Joe Biden be thinking today? Well, obviously, uh, Trump winning by double digits was not something unexpected. I think Haley did a little better than some of the polls had, but she didn't make it. Uh, I think that the fact that she's pledged to keep running is, uh, is, is many, in many ways, the ultimate insult to Donald Trump because he wants everyone uh, to just uh, prostrate and bow to him and say now it's over because what he's really concerned about is his four cases. And uh, I think uh, that when you watched his speech and how he tends to now ramble and go off the rails, you really are beginning to wonder if this is more than just some of us that politically oppose him, whether there's really something that has gotten to him, because he doesn't seem to be able to be coherent for a long amount of time. But I, I think that he will be the nominee, and I think that he's demanding people bow to him. Uh, there are few uh, moments in my life I've been more embarrassed than to watch Tim Scott, mm. uh, who, uh, uh, you know, I know Tim and I are both practicing Christians, but I don't know if he could pray like that to, to the other side. I mean, it was humiliating to watch what Tim Scott did uh, as a sitting senator. Uh, and, and one time it wasn't even, uh, he wasn't even on the script. He interrupted Trump to pay homage. Uh, and uh, so I had to say that because it's bothered me yeah, all he's night. He's doing it right here. It says, it's just that I love you, Mr. Trump. It's not that oh, I hate Nikki Haley. Politician. It's just that I love you from Senator Scott. It's uh, not a good I mean, day in, uh, in, no. in my life to watch Tim do that. I mean, to think that we fought to see people like him, black, become uh, uh, high elected in the South and to do that. He has a right to be a Republican. He has a right to do Donald Trump. But to do it in such a way that uh, is so humiliating was troubling. Let's put it that way. I'm well, trying to be I as mean, nice as I can. 54 years they were trying to get Roe v. Wade terminated, and I did it. And I'm proud to have done it. They wanted to get it back, right? You wouldn't be have that. There would be no question. Nobody else was going to get that done but that, me. Yeah. And we did it. And we did something that was a miracle. The former president during a Fox News town hall early this month bragging about overturning Roe v. Wade. Yesterday in Virginia, abortion health care was the focus of an impassioned campaign speech by President Joe Biden as he placed the blame for abortion bans across the country squarely on Donald Trump's shoulders. Let there be no mistake. The person most responsible for taking away this freedom in America is Donald Trump. Listen to what he says. Trump says he's proud that he overturned Roe v. Wade. He said, and I quote, there has to be punishment for the women exercising the reproductive freedom. He describes the Dobbs decision as a miracle. But for American women, it's a nightmare. So let's do be absolutely clear what Trump is bragging about. The reason there are 21 states where abortion bans are in effect made with no exception for rape or any other, or incest, is Donald Trump. It was Donald Trump and his Supreme Court who ripped away the rights and freedoms of women in America. And it'll be Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and all of you who are going to restore those rights for the women in America. In the past year, Trump himself endorsed a federal ban promising to lead the charge. God love him. And that means even if you live in a state where extremist Republicans are not in charge of the state government. Your right to choose, your right to privacy, 
is still at risk. But as long as I have power of the presidency, know this. If Congress were to pass a national abortion ban, I will veto it. I will veto it. Joining us now, Democratic Senator Tim Kaine of Virginia. Uh, Senator, first of all, how did President Biden do yesterday? It seems to me the contrast was, was set out last night with Donald Trump melting down in New Hampshire and Joe Biden looking pretty presidential in Virginia. Um, well, Mika, great to be with you guys this morning. And uh, President Biden picked up on a theme that is very powerful in Virginia and referendum results across the country since Dobbs have shown that it's not a regional issue, it's a national one. Virginia is now the last state in the South that essentially provides to women the protections that, that they were able to count on uh, under Roe v. Wade. We are it in the South. Uh, we just had state legislative elections where a Republican governor and Republican legislative candidates tried to pitch their own version of an abortion ban after 15 weeks. And Virginia voters handed both houses of our legislature to Democrats. This issue is not going away. And Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are going to remind voters on the trail every day that it was Donald Trump who has taken away your rights. And they, the Republicans under Donald Trump will go even farther. Senator, certainly your home state, Virginia, shows the power of abortion at the ballot box. We saw that last year. We certainly saw it in the 2022 midterms as well. I did want to ask you about something else that kept happening at that rally yesterday. As the president was repeatedly interrupted by, by protesters upset with his handling of the situation in the Middle East, upset about the, what's happening in Gaza right now. And I know there's been some differences in, in the Democratic Party as to what the approach should be. What is your level of concern about, first of all, just what you're seeing in the Middle East there in Gaza, but also how this could really dog the president going forward? Well, yeah, let's let's get to the human cost before we get to the politics. It's it's heartbreaking in a in a region of perennial heartbreak. This is just it, it, it's it's awful. The Hamas attack on October 7 was horrific and it was and it was designed and timed for a horrific purpose to disrupt a normalization discussion uh, between Israel and Saudi Arabia that actually had uh, at its center, a discussion about a Palestinian future. Hamas wanted to disrupt that. And then the heartbreaking toll of the war in Gaza in civilian deaths and in, in inadequate humanitarian aid. And now the escalation you're seeing throughout the region. So, no, I'm deeply concerned about it. I, I think, if it, again, before we get to the politics, I think the key right now is really redoubling efforts to get hostages released. Because I think uh, to get hostages released, as in the first instance, there would be a trade of hostages for Palestinian prisoners, and there would be a cessation of hostilities for some period of time. And when that happened, remember the Houthis stopped their escalation campaign during that pause in hostilities. So we need to de-escalate in the region. The last thing the United States needs is to be in another war in the Middle East, for God's sake. We need to de-escalate in the region. And I think the key to that is really uh, putting the focus back on the hostages and doing all we can together with the Israelis, the Qataris, Egyptians, to figure out a way to get hostages released. And in, in connection with that, you'll have a, a pause and hopefully a long one in hostilities where we can kind of re rebalance this, this chaotic situation. Good morning, Tim. Uh, I want to ask you about an issue that I hey, know Claire. that everybody's focused on up there, um, immigration. Uh, I think is a really serious issue. The southern border is a very serious political issue for the Democratic Party for November. I know that there is real negotiations that are coming close to a conclusion between Jim Langford, the Republican from Oklahoma, and Chris Murphy, the Democrat from Connecticut, and that you're very close to having a deal to vote on. My question is this. It's my understanding that Mitch McConnell had a very rough caucus meeting yesterday that the MAGA extremists within the Republican caucus have taken up the position that the House has taken, that they want the issue more than they want a solution. They don't want to pass anything because they want it to still be a huge problem. What assurance can you give us that the Democrats will vote on this bill, even if McConnell doesn't have a huge consensus in his caucus about, about voting for the negotiated immigration fix? Claire, you're right. This is really threading a needle because, um, you know, some want to just use it as a 
cudgel. They don't want to solve a problem. Some want to solve the problem, but have different ideas about how to solve it. I think you're going to see emerge within just a couple of days a deal that we will vote on in the Senate. I predict it's going to pass in a in a significantly bipartisan way, but you're going to lose Democratic votes and Republican votes. And Claire, as you know, uh, getting 60 votes, it's different if it's 50 Democrats and 10 Republicans than if it's, you know, 35 Democrats and 25 Republicans. Both add up to 60, but it's completely different in terms of what happens when that bill goes over to the House. And so I think the 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 plan is coming together. It will be Ukraine aid. It will be uh, a border provision. It will be Israel, Gaza. It will be state disaster relief and Indo-Pacific aid all in one package. But I think it's going to be a package that's going to lose some votes on the left and the right. Uh, you'll make everybody mad. Um, but oftentimes that's what has to happen to get something big done. And I think we're close. Senator Elise here. You said something just a moment ago hey, Elise. talking about foreign policy that made a lot of sense. We simply do not need another war in the Middle East, and you are part of a bipartisan letter to President Biden asking for more congressional oversight of the recent bombing of the Houthis. How much support is there for congressional authorization of the strikes in the Red Sea? There's different. There's a lot of different opinions about at least, but I think there's uniform desire. What's the strategy? What's the path to de-escalation? You you not only see the Houthis in the Red Sea, you see uh, Iranian-backed militias in Iraq and Syria. You've got challenges with Hezbollah. Um, there is just this sense of this widening escalation. I mean, even if just looking at Iran, act, Iran and Pakistan are going back and forth. There's a there's a regional escalation, much of it tied to the war in Gaza. And I think what we want from the administration is what's the strategy for de-escalation? What is the military strategy with respect to the Houthis? If you're if you're doing these attacks to deter and degrade the Houthis, but you're saying that you expect them to respond in kind and so they're not going to stop. Well, then what's the strategy? And then as, as you get that question, how do we de-escalate? De What's the strategy? Then you get to authorization questions. Congress has not authorized any military action against the Houthis in Yemen or the Red Sea. The president has cited self-defense, and he needs to defend American ships, American troops, American personnel. But most of the ships that go through the Red Sea are foreign flag ships. Self-defense does not apply to protecting the vessels of foreign nations. It might be a good strategy to do it, but the president can't just do it unilaterally without Congress. So we're going to we're, we're pressing the administration in a bipartisan way. What is the strategy? And then once we hear that, then we have to have the authorization discussion because we can't just stumble and slide into a into a broader regional conflict uh, without Congress taking it seriously and debating it in front of the American public.